you guys for coming to the first panel of the weekend. Uh, this is Did You Know? Uh, I, I guess I should kind of let everybody get settled, but um, yeah, uh, this is this is my co-host, Stephen Miller. He's the founder of Twin Peaks Block. Uh, my name is Vinny Gadera. I write for Twin Peaks Block too, uh, and we're gonna talk about some fun facts from filming. Uh, is this an uh, no, no. Thank you everyone for coming here today, really appreciate it, and uh, a big thank you to the Snoqualmie Valley Chamber of Commerce and the North Bend Downtown Foundation for hosting such a fun weekend, and to all those that have put this thing together, uh, it's exciting to be the first thing. <laughs> Hopefully this sets the stage for something fun uh, from this. So, um, so my name is Steven, uh, about six years ago I started uh, this thing called FunPeaksBlog.com, but I've been a fan uh, for 30 years. Uh, I first visited this area in 1996 for the Twin Peaks Fan Fest, back uh, back to the thing. And for some reason it took me 23 years to return, and so uh, very much like the return, it took me not that long. And um, I came out here in September of 2019 and just have continued to fall in love with this place because it's such there's such rich history. You know, the history of Twin Peaks and the history of Snoqualmie Valley go hand in hand. It was 35 years ago this past week on February 21st when the cameras started rolling just down the street from us uh, at uh, Tweed's Cafe. They shot some of the very first scenes for the pilot there on that day. So again, 35 years worth of history and it's uh, great that we're here talking about that today. Uh, through the research that I've done, I've just gathered some fun facts and just some interesting connections about the real Twin Peaks and the fictional town of David Lynch and Mark Frost's world. So, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge also the Snoqualmie tribe. A lot of the area in here is Snoqualmie tribe. You know, they were here first. They had a lot of land, and a lot of land is very sacred to the tribe. So, if you're going to go out and explore, just please be respectful and respect the land. And I also, if you stop by the Snoqualmie Falls Visitor Center, they have a new visitor center down there. Great, great exhibit in, in a gift shop and a cafe, but it talks a lot about the falls, the importance of the falls to the Snoqualmie, uh, Snoqualmie tribe, and uh, again, you can learn about how they respect the land uh, today. And of course, I'd also have to thank, just down the street, the uh, Snoqualmie Valley Historical Museum. If anyone been out to see the uh, the exhibit, it looks fantastic. You know, some of uh, so Vinny provided some props uh, uh, that, it's, um, uh, that he's collected, and uh, Jason was the, the chair. It's just, it's nice that the museum's acknowledging uh, the real Twin Peaks and, and the history of the show. So I've used that site, the Snoqualmie Valley Museum, uh, to gather some of this information, but you know, again, it's, I hope you find something interesting and insightful, and we even have a, a few surprises, so we'll go with that. Uh, I think to get started, Vinny. I think the best place to get started is maybe the welcome sign. The welcome sign. So uh, you've been out to see the welcome sign, right? And if you've been out recently, you notice that it looks a little different. Uh, there was a revetment project that was done uh, recently. Uh, the Snoqualmie River likes to flood. And it, when it floods, it washes away the embankment. So they had to do some work in order to make sure that Raining Road, where the sign is located, continues to be a road and that people travel on from that. But you might hear the name Raining, you know, and so uh, it's on Raining Road. Um, if you're going to go out to the site, you can still use the mountain. Mount Sai and the trees to kind of line up exactly where that sign spot was located. I was doing that uh, actually last night uh, at, the, at sunset. But the road itself was named uh, for the Raining family and they moved to the valley in about um, June of 1890. And it was Leonard and Margaret Raining and they were in Seattle. Mr. Raining had a German bakery. It was a lot of uh, pastries, cakes, you know, all sorts of stuff. In fact, in 1872, he was one of the first places in Seattle to offer ice cream, which is funny because there's so many ice cream shops here in, in uh, Snoqualmie and North Bend area, and David Lynch loves chocolates, uh, chocolate ice cream. Um, so they had three sons uh, that uh, they had Otto, Dio, and Eddie. They were living in Seattle. They had this big uh, pastry shop, this German bakery. It burned down in 1879. Um, 1881, they rebuilt, but then Mr. Randing, for whatever reason, decided he wanted to get out of town. And he did, and he sold his business right before the Great Fire of Seattle in the late 1880s. And he had a guy by the name of Mr. Gove, and he was here in the Snoqualmie Valley, his friends. He said, why don't you come out and visit, you know, here in Snoqualmie Valley. He had a hops farm. And hops was a huge crop that was here in the Snoqualmie Valley area, very important to the region. Uh, they loved it so much, they bought 120 acres. <laughs> so they bought a lot of land. 
Uh, the Reinigs moved out here. The sons, Otto and Dio, established the Reinig Brothers store. It's a general store that was in Snoqualmie about 1902. A couple years later, Mr. Reinig had passed. But um, Dio, um, he would go on um, to purchase a bunch of land and near his father's farm and you know, be a, a, a figure doing a lot of work in the community, helping shape the valley. Um, but Otto would go on to serve as Snoqualmie's mayor from 1905 to 1915. He'd later go on to be a postmaster uh, um, for about 31 years uh, uh, in this area. And then Eddie, he briefly worked at the Snoqualmie Falls um, Power Company, so that's the uh, where they generate a lot of power for the region. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, he went on to go to the city of Seattle, working at Cedar Falls. He unfortunately tragically died being electrocuted in 1912. So you had Otto and Dio, they continued to be in the region here for a long time. The general store spot still is a thing, uh, not obviously called a general store today. Um, but it's kind of fitting that we started with the, the road because that's the road that everybody loves to go and visit. You know? Uh, the Rainings are basically the Milfords of the real community. Yeah, basically. I think that's that they've been here for a long time. 1890. Yeah, uh, was, uh, uh, yeah while we're on uh, early established Twin Peaks locations, uh, let's talk about some more early settlers and uh, their relation to Twin Peaks. Yeah, because you know, the Rainings were not the only family. In fact, uh, we're going to go to a place uh, here. This is the Rainings themselves. You can tell 1890s, you know, they definitely uh, fit the piece here. We're going to go over to the uh, Fat Trout Trailer Park. You might wonder why the Fat Trout uh, is, uh, is this spot. Uh, long ago, Fat Trout used to be what's known as Fort Alden. And uh, Fort Alden was established um, probably about 1856. But there was a gentleman by the name of Jeremiah Borst. And he is known as the father of Snoqualmie Valley. Um, Fort Alden was established in 1856 by the Washington uh, militia. You know, and the reason is there was, obviously the tribes were in the area here, a lot of white settlers were coming into town. They established a lot of kind of forts along the way because there was a treaty that was done in 1855, the, the Treaty of uh, uh, Point Elliot. And again, it was trying to divide up land and try to, but again, the tribes were like, we're here first, we're gonna attack some cities, we're gonna, you know, trying to take the land back for, for themselves. So they established these forts, and one of them is Fort Alden, which is the spot where the original Fat Trout Trailer Park was um, for David Lynch's film. So they, they established this thing in 1956, or I'm sorry, 1856, and thinking that there's gonna be skirmishes, there's gonna be some challenges. A year later, nothing happened. There was uh, nothing. So this guy named Jeremiah Horst, who is not Vinny, but uh, is giving uh, a run for his money here today. Uh, so we need to go as that as, as, as the, 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 the costume contest. It's here to go as Jeremiah Horst. Um, a real deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Uh, so Jeremiah Horst, here he is. He comes into the uh, town about 1858. Uh, he finds Fort Alden unoccupied, so he's like, I'm gonna move in here. So he just like takes up land, and he starts um, <laughs> the, uh, living in this old uh, like fort that was no longer occupied from that. Um, he ended up buying a ton of land, uh, like acres, hundreds and hundreds of acres uh, in this area here. Um, and he then lived until 1890, about the same time the Rainings came to the town, but he died of typhoid uh, fever in 1890. Uh, he's buried up at Falls City Cemetery. And uh, I visited the location. This is his headstone here, we're looking at this. There's also Josiah Merritt, who's buried up there. And you might know him as Uncle Cy. Uncle Cy being named uh, Mount Cy, the mountain that's right outside here. So he's also buried up in that area. And I think his headstone looks a little bit like actual Mount Cy itself. But Jeremiah there um, was, uh, was uh, there. But he, again, he acquired so much land in the area, and he did so much growing in that area. Um, he planted Apple Orchard, where Mount Cy High School is now located. So that was, again, nothing but farmland at the time. He ended up selling a lot of that land to the Meadowbrook Farm, and then he, he moved to the Tollgate Farm. Uh, before passing with that type of paper. So, um, but again, that Fort Alden area, that whole fat trout, that's like such an important part of this Mpomi Valley history, and he was a uh, big father lived there. I doubt that Lynch and company probably. I, I'm sure they didn't know, but it's. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just nice a neat connection, I think, between them. Uh, but we did move from the original fat trout as seen in Firewalk Scene yeah. to a new location for the third season. <coughs> It's just down the street from us. It's the town mobile home park. And you might wonder, well, why did it move, right? So why didn't they just go back to the fat trout? Well, there's nothing at the fat trout right now. And a big reason why is this. 
Um, it's called flooding. And we mentioned earlier the Snoqualmie River likes to flood a lot. So uh, this, they had some devastating floods in 1990. And then in the 2000s, particularly in 2008 and then 2009, was like the time that King County was like, okay, we're done. We got to like do something with these people. This is the this is the, the fat trout right down here. And you can tell it's just the water's coming right up into this area here and getting so much flooding. They worked with FEMA to get about $1.1 million to relocate the folks that were living in about 20 mobile homes. And then from 2009 to 2011, basically demolished all of it, turned it into an open field, uh, which is what you can find today. You can still kind of match up where things kind of are using the backgrounds, you know, in the mountains and such, but uh, that fat trial is no more. Carl Rudd has since moved. He has, you know, still don't bother him before 9 a.m. <laughs> uh, so do we want to switch gears a little bit here? I know. If you guys aren't familiar with Steven's research, he's maybe the best sleuth I know. Uh, and I'm sure some strange things crop up when you're doing digging into the historic region. It is, you know, there's a lot of history in this region, so, um, and there are some strange things. I mean, I think a quirky town like Twin Peaks, you know, obviously the real world uh, has some things. And, and one of those um, happens to be this. Uh, if you recognize this building, it's seen in Twin Peaks Firewalk with me, but in part, in season three, it's home to um, it's Gerson's apartment, so Gerson people lives there, and um, this is the Colonial Square Apartments. Um, it used to be a hotel uh, back when the town of Meadowbrook was established. Meadowbrook was uh, established in the early 1920s for the mill workers, so they worked across the street, you know, across the, the river, basically over at the Stokholm Falls Lumber Company. They established this town. That's where the Brook Theater, that's the Moe's Motor, that was a the thing. There was a bunch of different shops. They had a hotel here. It later became apartments. But in 1976, uh, it's important to read this says, but it basically uh, shots shatter calm and sleepy snow palming. So uh, it, what what ended up happening was um, there was a. Uh, domestic skirmish, and it, it's it's interesting how it plays out in the episode, because it just actually kind of happens. So there was a guy named Will, uh, Wilbur Allen, who was visiting his sister on the second floor of the apartments, and something happens where uh, Michael Edward Mitchell shoots him in the chest, and uh, with a gun, and he crawls down, he's in the um, uh, first floor, down the stairs, he crawls down, they find him, he dies later at a hospital, uh, but at the time, not a lot of murders were happening here in the Snoqualmie area, to the point where, again, there's a newspaper headline that you know talks about this. The, the mayor at the time, uh, who was Charles Peterson, he had just been um, sworn in in 1974, so it's 1976. He thought this was like the only murder that's really ever happened in the town. There was other murders. There, I found research in the 1900s. There being no, it's nothing. Yeah, no, but it, it was it was not common, right, from this perspective. Uh, so um, little did he know that yeah. this town would be. Pop culture epicenter based around <laughs> I mean, exactly. That's, I was like, wow, that's pretty wild. But the fact that, again, shots were fired in, in, in season three at this uh, thing, and again, I doubt that they made the connection between the two. It was just happened to, to be that way. Uh, but Charles Peterson, interesting, if you've been to the Centennial Log over in Snoqualmie, um, he was instrumental in bringing that log to uh, Snoqualmie as part of the 100th anniversary uh, celebration. And um, but yeah, he, he was mayor for a couple of uh, speaking of uh, Snoqualmie, we're speaking of Snoqualmie. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about the name Snoqualmie. Well, we're sitting in Snoqualmie. Yes. Well, actually, we used to be called Snoqualmie. This was called Snoqualmie Prairie. And uh, there was a guy named Max Peterson um, who had a um, bunch of land in this area, which has now become the town of North End. He ended up moving out to the Cascades in like 1879 or so and, and contacted Jeremiah Borsi, right? Your buddy. And uh, he's like, hey, I want to get this land. So Jeremiah contacts this guy named Will Taylor. And Will had been working in California in the mines. He used to live here, but he, he left, you know, get rich, you know, out in the mines in California. Uh, so he comes back, Forrest is like, look, Taylor, I'll give you the land. You just got to provide labor for me. So, you know, Taylor's like, awesome. You know, I'm going to name the town Snoqualmie Prairie, which is, uh, which is nice. Uh, but the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railway were like, yeah, no, not so much. And the reason why is just down the line, there's this other town called Snoqualmie Falls. So they had Snoqualmie Prairie and Snoqualmie Falls, and the line was like, that's going to be too confusing for us to when we drop off deliveries and so forth. So Charles Baker, he plotted the land for what became Snoqualmie. He had named it Snoqualmie Falls after the falls that were nearby. Uh, here we hear in the town of North Bend, which is then... Uh, Taylor's like, okay, well, I'm going to change it to Mountain View. 
because it's a view of or the mountain that's right behind us, right? So he loves that name. He's like, Mountain View's it. But the post office is like, yeah, no, because <laughs> there's a town named Mountain View up in the northwestern part of Washington State, so we can't have that. So he ended up changing it to North Bend. And North Bend, because it is the North Bend, you know, the, Snoqualmie, the South and Middle Fork River is kind of where this is, so it's North Bend. Taylor didn't really like the name, but we went to Mountain View. We went through all of the literal options. Yes. We have a view of a mountain, we can't call it Mountain View. <laughs> exactly. It's the northernmost bend. So we'll call it North Bend. You know, so it became Snoqualmie down the way. There's another Snoqualmie Falls, which we'll talk about here uh, in just a moment. Uh, but interesting thing about Baker, um, so Charles Baker, I think he's the Ben Horn of the situation. Quite you know, exactly. and literally, and this is the funniest thing. And when I found this, I was like, you gotta be kidding me, right? So Charles Baker, he is a civil engineer. He creates the first underground power thing at Snoqualmie Falls, right? So he's doing this. He plots the land that becomes the town of Snoqualmie. He has a substation down in 2nd Avenue in Seattle, right? Now this substation is the Baker Building. It had two floors. It was a substation that took energy from the, you know, uh, the falls, and he, you know, was a you know, sent it out to Seattle, Tacoma region, and so forth. But you might recognize this building if you watch episode five. Uh, or six of season one. This is the Baker Building, which happens to be the Horns Department Store. <laughs> so here, again, I doubt that they realize that I'm Baker sure. was it's like, just, you know, the dude that's one of the very few right? Seattle locations yes. that's used in Twin Peaks yeah. as connections to yeah. Snoqualmie. Yeah, which is, I mean, I thought it was just amazing. It it went through this iteration of it had two floors and it had three floors and it had five floors. There was an earthquake that took out some top floors and they got rid of. So, but here it is, you know, most recently, uh, you know, the Baker Building still is there. But the fact that there's a connection between the falls, and I'm thinking the Great Northern, I'm thinking Ben Morney is a store, it just has to be, right? You yeah. know, that guy. Uh, should we move on to another local figure? Yeah, another local uh, figure. Yeah. Uh, if you guys, you guys have all seen the sheriff's station, even down to Dirtfish. Uh, there is a monument that was prominently featured in the original series. There was a sundial with uh, this gentleman's portrait on it, yeah. but it's not there anymore. It's not there. I don't know where it went to. Nobody knows where it went to. It's, it was there for like 90 years. This is W.W. W. Warren, and he was the manager of the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company, which became the Weir Alder Sawmill. It was opened in 1917, and he was the first manager that was running this. Um, he loved his he loved his employees. He took care of them. He and people loved him. He tragically died early at the age of 45 in 1921. And that memorial that is found out in front of the, the sheriff's station here, you can see it in the uh, season one, and then obviously season three it's gone. Uh, uh, it was gathered from funds, you know, that. But he, he was so he cared so much about his employees. Um, that he encouraged Weyerhaeuser's uh, uh, company to establish a town. Then it had 250 homes, it had a hospital, schools, it had bars, it had all sorts of stuff. It was literally right behind the sheriff's department area, you know, up on the hill. They had a hospital, and he was concerned because the hospital, the closest one was Fortman, and, you know, they're down in Stokalmi, and if there's an accident that happened, and there had been some accidents that happened at the mill, that was, you know, a crucial time to try to, you know, it would have taken forever to, to get over to North Bend. So uh, he established that piece of it. Um, he ended up um, uh, dying, uh, and this memorial itself, uh, again, was one of a couple of different ones. Another one um, you can see today uh, is down in Snoqualmie. It is the United Methodist Church, and um, this window uh, that's there was actually from his wife. And after he passed, she had given money to have this window, this uh, stained glass window, installed inside the church. The Warren Voting Precinct is another name of, um, that is attributed to him, and Warren Avenue is uh, another one as well. But he was uh, an important figure in the history of logging in the Snoqualmie uh, Valley, and that's that thing. But I, I wish I knew where it went. And, uh, it's one of the uh, great of, mysteries. One of the mysteries, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Actually, you know, and funny, um, down the street um, from the sawmill, uh, the town again kind of went down. And, and in 1929, there was a beautification project that was done. And uh, I love this this piece of it. Uh, they planted a bunch of sycamore trees. One in front of each house. One in front of each house. And the town continued um, until probably the 1950s or so. And then they ended up moving like 90 homes, like, you know, across the way and, and, and kind of to other areas. But the trees still stand there. And you can see it if you. Blink, you might miss it, but it's uh, the scene where Laura in Firewalk with Me is driving to Harold's, and to, and, uh, where he's supposed to be in Lowtown uh, area. 
uh, but she drives literally under the sycamore trees, which I thought was just a nice, again, poetic touch. They probably didn't realize that either. I'm I sure they did. I mean, maybe they did. I don't know. I no. think there's uh, too, too many too many connections for this not to be some kind of a cosmic. It has to be, right? Now, these universal factors in the play. Yeah. Even, so. even sycamore trees factor yes. into the real time. Yes. Uh, should we move on to Sunset Highway? Um, well, we can. Yeah, actually, Sunset Highway is an important one. So, uh, yeah, anyone recognize this? The traffic light, right? You know, in fact, if we were here in 1989, uh, you'd see that one traffic light kind of right out here in the intersection of, of Bendigo and uh, North Bend Way. Um, but it wasn't always here. It wasn't this? This road here was uh, the road, the last stop, the town before you got to the Cascades. So this was like the high traffic area, and for a long time. It uh, caused a lot of backups, you know, because you had a lot of tourists that were coming through this town, and they would stop right here and again get the backups because we had thousands and upon thousands of folks that come through. I will town. say that so, hasn't changed. Yeah, probably hasn't actually. Uh, <laughs> the stoplights look a little different now, right? Does a uh, yellow light still mean slow? Down? It does mean slow down. In fact, it, they finally installed the traffic light in 1965, so it got so bad that you know that. But that's why a lot of these like places, like even. Tweed's Cafe, uh, Jared Lyon, who, uh, again, longtime fan, he was doing his research about um, the uh, cafe. He found a picture of the sign used to be turned so that when you were coming into town, you could see that it was a cafe sign. You know, they ended up turning it, I don't know exactly when, but they must have turned it sometime after 1961. You're, you're a great sleuth. Yeah. You figured out when they installed I know, the traffic light. I know, like, I know, I, know. I, gotta, I gotta work on that. I got my All work right. cut out for me. But that's, again, Mount Sy Motel, North Bend Motel, all these little, like, Roadside stops were all because the traffic that came through this area was so great and it was on its way to the um, uh, uh, the Cascades. And again, in, you know, the the government created an I-90 then, you know, from that. So that was again a bypass from this area here. And that's what happens sometimes. You know, towns get bypassed and you know traffic doesn't necessarily. Come. But still, as you can attest, there's still lots of traffic that does come through this way. Uh, uh, welcome to see the cafe. Uh, we do see a little bit more of stuff. We do. Uh, if you go out to Deer Meadow, uh, which is actually out toward Alali, it is uh, the old Sunset Highway um, that was created. And that was created uh, in the 1920s. Um, it is, uh, the, the road itself is, they're driving in the opposite direction. They're headed toward I-90 uh, versus if you head the other way, they're toward, you know, um, that was the road that it was supposed to be stretched all the way to Seattle. So this kind of road here. So it's a very historic road when it comes to the growth of automobiles in the area and getting people out to the Cascade Mountains. Uh, but they, it's the road to Deer Meadow. But you talk about roads in, in some of the, the you know, when I was reading about the changes to the highway and so forth. So there was a lot of changes that happened as, as traffic continued to go out. It's not that far away from Seattle when people get out to the mountains. Uh, but there was roads that did go through Fall City. You know, that was a major town. The Roadhouse that's uh, that's out there. I'm staying there this this time, and uh, you actually can't stay in the Roadhouse, and it's actually really nice. I, it's, I think I'm the only one there, uh, which is really <laughs> just, it's peaceful. It's like my own suite um, uh, from that. But you recognize this place. This is uh, Big Ed's Gas Farm. It's a, a balloon store now, but it's been what else? It's, it's been, been so many things. <laughs> it's, been so it's been a stone and tile store. Yeah, yeah. It's been a windsock store. Yeah. I yeah. can't believe that didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> it was a hydroponic shop for a while. Yeah. Uh, but that was almost not big as gas No. You know, I found they did location shooting in this area. Uh, and they were trying to find different places, you know, that were um, going to be standing in for different, you know, stuff. Smokey Joe's was one place that they considered back when they were filming the pilot. And another one was actually this one, uh, which is interesting. It's out in Duval, and it's known as the Zalstra Dairy Farm. And it's literally a farm, and it's run down. There's nothing there now. I mean, it's a. Uh, Looks abandoned from that, but it could explain why it was called the Big Gas, gas Farm, farm. Yeah. <laughs> because it may have considered this. I don't know what the reason why they didn't go there. Um, Duval, though, it's 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 a hike. It's past Carnation. You have to keep going down this road, and, and clearly, Fall City is just a little bit closer, I think, to that region there. But but it's interesting. You you found some research about uh, about what was called Butchies yes. at the time. So yeah. what did end up being Big Ed's mm -hmm. Gas Farm uh, was originally a service station and grocery store called Butchies uh, that was built by Lawrence Butch Fredeen and his wife Agnes. Uh, it was built in 1940 uh, when the construction of Highway 10 forced them to move from their previous location. Uh, 
there was an interview in, I, I think, 1987, uh, where Butch said they were given $800 in a month to move. Oh, lovely. Uh, <laughs> so that's when they built their new store at the gas farm location. Uh, and a year later, uh, they completed construction on their home across the street, uh, which is the Hurley House, as seen in Twin Peaks. So literally, like, the owner of the gas station lived literally across the street yes. in the home. It's so funny. when you see Big Ed and Nadine yelling at each other across the street, it's entirely possible that actually <laughs> Agnes was <laughs> with Butch and Agnes for Nadine. Not sure about the Drape Runners, though. Not sure. <laughs> no mention of Drape Runners. No, no. I don't know what Agnes' deal was. But <laughs> She seems, been that, she seems <laughs> much more, uh, much more fun. That's funny, you know. But again, the, the dairy farm it was one of those uh, locations considered, uh, who knows what's going to happen. You know, there's another did you know that I loved uh, thing. You know, it is the students at Mount Sai High. Uh, this is a copy of the 1989 uh, yearbook uh, that some of my friends, and in here, I don't know if you can find it easily, but there's an image of, of Ron Garcia. Uh, who is uh, who's the, the director of photography for the pilot, and he's sitting here in a Panavision camera. I don't know if I can find it easily here. Um, like taking shots. And they, they didn't they didn't mention anything about it um, in the uh, show, but you know what's interesting, Vinny, is that they actually had students from the school that were here. This. So uh, this is uh, Ron Garcia, and uh, he's actually shooting some of the high school scenes, you know, from that. But again, they don't they don't mention Twin Peaks in this. They don't say anything. This is 1989, so they couldn't say anything probably at the time. Yeah, non-disclosure reasons. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was still a, a long uh, uh, time from that. But again, pretty neat to see. But they used students, you know, real students, um, real students uh, in, and some of them were in the drama class, from what I understand. And for the longest time, I have wondered. Who's the dude that does the moonwalk, right? Like, anyone else curious about that? Well, folks, I'm excited to say that we have him here in the room today. I'm not kidding you. And Jim, if you could join us here. His name is Jim Pennington. You don't, you don't have to moonwalk Jim, I wore my booth. I'm looking for a bunch of thing. Jim, thank you for, for joining us here. Uh, a surprise guest that uh, when we were, we were talking, we thought, well, I guess this is such a great way to talk about did you know, right? And uh, the fact that that. But let's talk about you, first of all. Okay. Uh, who are you? What's your name? Jim Pennington, class of 1990, Mount Sai High School. Right on. Um, I was in the drama class as a junior in high school. And um, that's when we learned from the teacher that she had a special surprise for us. That there was going to be a movie production company coming to town and that uh, they wanted to use real students for background people. And she kind of dropped the bomb and said they want seniors. And we're like, oh, there's like, sure, juniors, juniors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> so, so yeah, everybody in the drama is welcome to participate. So, like, yes. Awesome. And it was just a blast. But that's how it started. So. But today you're a magician. Yeah, magician among other things. Yeah. yeah. So how do you get the magic? Uh, that would be um, with my mom. I'm not supposed to talk about magic with gum in my mouth. Yes. <laughs> right. My mom always said that. Like this. Like this. Fresh. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> magic. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll say that. When he has the cream corn, that's what <laughs> 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 working on that. It's in production. Um, so yeah, my mom and I would go to. Uh, Library, so Palmy Library, yeah. and they had an excellent. I, I found my way to the, the sports and games and, and, and magic, so that's where I got into that. It was my, my time with mom. She was her thing, I did my thing, and I just blew up from there. And uh, my friends mentioned when I talked to you on the yeah. phone a week ago that uh, when I was 16, I, I got hired at the Market Magic and Pike Place Market. Okay. Uh, two years through high school, so through the production of this, and, they, and the owners were just like, You're in that? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like <laughs> and that's cool. Talk, boy. Yeah, you yeah. say something. Yeah, because yeah. they're huge fans of like David Lynch and, and Khan Film Festival, all the film festivals, yeah. they got all that. So um, that's kind of how I got started in magic. And, and so uh, let's talk about the, uh, so you grew up here like, in, yeah. in this area. So yeah. what was it like growing up here in the Palmy Valley? It was really strange. The Palmy, <laughs> yeah, the Palmy, we, we had, uh, moved here from the East Coast, North Carolina, when I was just in the second grade. but. Uh, we grew up in Sopalmi, and I went to Sopalmi Elementary, middle school, high school. Uh, it was, you know, it was small. It wasn't as popular. It really wasn't. It was a lot smaller, lots of nooks and crannies. You know, we did our, 
play, go out and play, and come back when the street lights come on, you know, that kind of thing. So it was an adventure. We did a lot of outdoor stuff, you know, it's a point ball, it's like a playground. Yeah. We just ride our bikes up there and play early morning Saturdays. And, yeah, we just ride our bikes down there and, you know, just kick it all day long. Um, train tracks down on the way. And just thinking it was funny, but that wasn't the best stop. Yeah. None of it. So we would go playing through those those train, train graveyard, you know. And uh, that was really kind of uh, spooky and weird, and, you know, all the little weird things. So here we're at school, and the teacher says, "Hey, we're going to do this thing. We're going to be extras, you know, in in the uh, in the pilots." Uh, can you talk a little bit about well, that? You were in the classroom scene. Right? Yeah, yeah, I was in the classroom scene as well, and um, they had corralled all of the. Of the extras in that room, you see that picture there. There's a room right there. So all the students that are in that room are like heads lined around looking at me. And I'm this chubby kid, you know. They've got bullied in high school for, you know, all that. And I was just so nervous. But uh, yeah, here in the the hall from the classroom team, and I remember um, seeing Cheryl uh, and Ben, and I was in the back, and James. Marshall was over here in the corner. He's got to do that pencil snap thing. And I remember he reached in his pocket and grabbed a handful of pencils out. I remember the director, you got your pencil? He's like, <laughs> and he kind of, no. Went, he was kind of, he was just a cool guy. And then Cheryl and Ben, of course, so just, I was just mesmerized by those beautiful legs and those red pumps. And I was just, you know, go yeah. goo gaga. And it was fun. And then uh, at some point, David Lynch, or the, the, the uh, casting director, or, or assistant casting director, said, uh, the director has a, something to ask you guys, everybody listen up. And David Lynch pokes his head in there and says, can anybody do a moonwalk? <laughs> yeah, just like that, nothing else. And I was like, I was in the break dancing at the time, in middle school and high school, I was just like, you know, pop and lock and all that stuff. And moonwalk was one of my specialties. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I didn't have the right shoes. And I was, there was gonna be a lot of attention on me. And I was just like, yeah, two guys. There was one other guy. He did a moonwalk. He just kind of goes, eh, anybody else? And I said, I can do a sideways moonwalk. And he's like, sideways moonwalk, huh? What's that look like? And I did it right there, going to, towards the locker. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Somebody grabbed my arm, and it's literally, it was like a, it was like a movie. Ooh. And um, yeah, so we rehearsed it one time, and he kind of let me do what I would do. Yeah. And then when we did it again, he kind of gave me a tip. He said, can you do like the picture hair in the mirror or something? And you can or? see that. He yeah. is fixing his hair. There's a yeah. shot right before it comes this, and he's actually combing that his hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I play the guitar or something like that. We did one take, and I let spun around and, and moonwalked out the thing, and he said, is that how you're going to do it? <laughs> and I go, uh, do it? Do it. What? It's like, well, you left the locker open when you did your, your dance there, and is that how you're going to do it? You know, I didn't know what to take. I thought what we were doing in Europe was like, all right, let's do it again. I'm like, ugh. It's like four takes. I'm just like, oh, this is crazy. And that camera was it's huge. It's the camera like whole thing hallway. Was really awesome. like, oh. I can see how people just freeze when they see a camera like that. It's like crazy. So, um, yeah, we did the last one, and I'm like, okay, shut the locker. That's all I had to do. I can see my everybody in the mirror, but I'm doing my hair like that, looking at me, you know, just like just shaking like a lady. Um, did it one more time, and that was it. And uh, James Marshall came up in, in between takes, and, and he just kind of just kind of put me at ease a little bit, talked to me a little bit, and he said, "That's going to be a weird scene, huh?" And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> I just looked away, and I can see him by the corner of my eye. I'm like, "Oh my god!" He kind of goes, <laughs> "You know, like so leave him alone." And Cheryl and Fan. I love her. She, I just felt the touch on my shoulder like that, and in my ear I heard her go, nice job. She whispered, nice job. I was just like, oh, what a nice lady, you know. So I have that beautiful uh, experience there. She's such a sweetheart, and everybody, they're all so nice. The staff, the, the, the staff, the uh, crew was, was just absolutely professional in every way. They were so neat. Uh, best week ever. The snowstorm. Uh, perfect timing because they came to town, snowed two feet, closed down the school for a week, and they got all the shooting. 
called it. It was like, it was great. How convenient. Yeah, and there was a really neat. It was a cold shoot, too, because there was, a, again, winter weather was pretty bad. Uh, it was, yeah. James and Donna seen in the woods. I mean, it literally was freezing when they were doing uh, that. Yeah. But the fact that you were doing it before. Do you remember seeing the moonwalk for the first time? Yeah, I think Michael it was Jackson. Uh, was like, Michael you know, Jackson, yeah. yeah. Saw the video music awards. I was a big Michael Jackson fan. I saw that. And uh, yeah, all the breaking, breaking two. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Beat Street, King of the Beat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you being here today. I mean, you thought it would be a nice touch to talk about, did you know, in real Twin Peaks. And Jim, thank you for thank you. Can I give yeah, a please. shout out to yeah. the the nice young lady that tracked me down, and she is the detective. She is a sleuth. Her name is Lordita Teresa. She's on Instagram as um, Penny Draper, I think, and she's friends with, with you and, and, and Luca and Pauli and, and uh, um, several of Aaron, Aaron Cohen will be out in town tomorrow. So uh, she is a super nice lady, very artistic, and just a super awesome person to do that and track me down and just open things up. And, and just, like, it's been just really neat. You know, it's such an iconic scene. I had no idea. That, like, you had no I idea at the time. I didn't know. I found out about this. I'm like, what? <laughs> you played <laughs> Snow Pony's most famous break dancer for 30 years. <laughs> 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 but again, it's something that we've all wondered, yeah. you know, yeah. over time. Who was the guy who did this? I wore the wrong shoes again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're really glad that you were able to be here today. Thank uh, you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. So that is, uh, that is Did You Know. Uh, you can follow Vinny on uh, as well, Rainbow Trout uh, on Instagram. He does a lot of props. We're going to be doing a prop panel in just a, a couple hours here down, down the street. Um, uh, at 3 p.m. we're heading over to Friends & Co. Uh, with Prop Master Jeff Moore from the second season. Yep, I'm glad uh, Jeff's going to be there too. And Jason's going to be a part of that as well. And then uh, again, I'm uh, Stephen from the Twin Peaks blog. And, just so grateful to see so many familiar friends and faces in town for this event. It's going to be a wonderful and strange time. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you.